All right. Well, I thought of this song, and uh, please, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way. I, I thought of this song because I did think of your pastor. I thought of uh, Brother Maple, and I thought of many, many years that he's been here faithfully serving the Lord. And that's nothing to sneeze at. That, that is, and that's something that should be respected and honored. We live in a day and age where I honestly, I, I think the last I had heard was the lifespan of a pastor, uh, even in independent Baptist churches, I think it's like three years or less. Right. And it's, it's pretty sad. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, pastors are, are, are not always not at fault themselves. There's sometimes right. where there's definitely problems there. But I, the, more, the, the older I get, the more I respect folks who are willing to stay where God's put them and place them. It doesn't mean God doesn't move people. Some people God does move, and I believe that with all my heart. There's a time, hey, sometimes there's just a specific time where God says, I need you here instead of there. Um, but thank God for those preachers who are willing to stick around. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the truth of the matter is the message hasn't changed. But the world's changed to some degree. Right. They've, they've, they've let their doctrine and the truth and all those things kind of slip off. Slip off. The church has changed, right? right. It's, not, it's not like we, we used to know it. I mean, you literally, people used to, everybody went to church. It didn't matter what denomination you were, you went to church. Right. Now it's hard to find people in church today. Right. Um, but uh, as, as the days go by, we see sometimes see the, the uh, churches dwindle a little bit. I've noticed our independent, we have an independent Baptist uh, youth fellowship up there in the north. And uh, we've noticed that even those youth fellowships, the groups, not just because of COVID, but they just shrunk. Youth, youth groups have just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And it's sad to watch, but I'm thankful for the old preacher man who's willing to stand in his pulpit and be faithful till God takes him home. And there is a reward for that preacher man. And I want to sing that. We'll sing that in the last verse. Yep. Here is 
last bird and he's resting that heavenly land. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. Oh, it's just great. There's a race to be run. You can make baseball tonight so got a message for you that I want to share with you kind of goes a little bit along with this morning of course anything goes along with this morning because we all need the touch of the Lord's hand and uh, anytime we go through any situation in life we need the Lord's touch um, but I want you to know tonight sometimes life can do some strange things to us can it some strange things can happen, things that we never expected. You may be able to look back over the last year, or year and a half, and say, we sure didn't expect that. You know, it makes you wonder what's coming next. But who knows? We don't know. But I want you to know the Lord does. The Lord does know. And I want you to see this psalm real quickly. We're not going to spend a lot of time in here. But I want to preach a message this evening entitled, When Life Throws You a Curveball. When life throws you a curveball, it says here in Psalm 13, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Anybody here tonight, you don't have to raise your hand. Anybody here tonight at some point in time kind of felt like maybe the Lord left you? <laughs> of course, we all feel that way. Where is, where is he? You know, it seems like he should be here and he should be closer. He says he's near. He says he's close. Well, the psalmist says, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? It's interesting, the more we think about things in life, and if we let things discourage us and we struggle with those things, uh, we can ask more and more questions, can't we? It goes on in verse 2, it says, How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. I think that's be every one of our prayers tonight would be that, Lord, please hear our prayers. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. You know, it's funny as we get older, right? As we get older, I remember when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to go to my, <clears throat> we used to go to my aunt's house for uh, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Eve, and so we'd try to stay there till midnight, all right? And uh, anybody remember the old movies, uh, The Man from Snowy River? All right. We used to, I don't know what it was, but that was a tradition. We'd get those movies out, The Man from Snowy River, and we'd watch those movies on New Year's Eve. I remember one specific time where we were watching a movie, and it was really hard to hear. It wasn't because there was anything wrong with the speakers on the, uh, the TV or anything like that, but it was because my dad was laying on the floor snoring as loud as he possibly could. I made the mistake as a pipsqueak teenager to tap him on the foot and say, hey, Dad, you're snoring. Don't wake up a, a, a sleepy bear, okay? Not a good idea. Dad wasn't real happy about that. But we used to tease Dad a lot. We used to tease Dad often. You know, we'd get a movie out, I mean, it'd be 9 o'clock and Dad's asleep. 
Like, what's the matter with you, Dad? You didn't get five minutes into the movie. That's me now. Be careful who you make fun of when you're young. Because you find yourself turning into that. Boy, we get sleepy. Our eyes get so tired. Your eyes get so sleepy sometimes. Just, oh, you'll just nod off. One of our guys at our church tells us, he's, I said, what are you going to do after you leave church? He says, I'm going to go watch my favorite movie. I said, what's that? And he says, eyelids. <laughs> Never watched that movie, but that's not what he's not talking about movie. He's talking about closing his eyes to sleep. And we get tired, don't we? We get weary. And David is, or the psalmist here, David is, is weary. He says, it goes on, he says, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Boy, it seems like this is just not going to end well for me. Verse 4, it says, lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray. Father, give me the clarity tonight. Give me wisdom tonight to be able to share this truth uh, from the Word of God that we need to keep our eyes on you, Lord, no matter what's going on, no matter what life is throwing at us, or shall I even say tonight the devil is throwing at us, or this world may be throwing at us. We know he's the prince of the power of the air, and, and that, Lord, uh, the world seems to love him and live for him, but yet we as Christians sometimes feel like we're out there like Elijah like we're the only one, even though that wasn't true. Elijah felt that way, though. Life had thrown him so many curveballs. He, he had just sl slain the prophets of Baal, and now he's running from one woman. And Lord, you had to remind him that there were others that were faithful and that were still there and that were still standing. Lord, I pray that you'd help remind us today that no matter what life is throwing at us, that we would keep our eyes on you and, Father, that we would remain true. Our churches, our doctrine, our, our belief system, our music even, Lord, would remain holy and righteous and pleasing to you. Everything that we do, the steps that we take, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. May our steps be ordered by you, no matter what we may face. All oh, the winds may howl, the storms will blow, we may get hail, we may get snow. We may get the burning heat, but, Lord, we know that you are there with us. And, Father, we'd ask that you'd help us to follow through and finish the course that you've given us. And we'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We, uh, my son, Alden, uh, played baseball for, I think, maybe six to eight years, somewhere around there, six, eight, six, eight years. He played for a little league team up in Erie. And, he enjoyed it, <clears throat> left-handed pitcher, so they loved him just because there's not too many left-handed pitchers, especially at that age and at that level. And so um, he, he tended usually to be our, our starting pitcher, that type of thing, no matter whatever team he was on, not because he's that great and I'm not bragging on him. It's just a matter of him being a left-hander, and it's hard to find pitchers, especially at that age. Kids that can actually, by the way, let me just say this, kids that can actually throw the ball across the plate. And so... It was funny, we were down at Camp Victory a few years ago, and there was, they were playing a softball game down there, and, and none of the adults could get the softball across the plate. And I'm like, what's going on? My son is not, he's like 10 years old or something. He's not even supposed to be at team camp, but I'm like, hey, I know he can get it across the plate. And they're like, okay, come on, pitch for us. So he pitched the whole time, and it worked out real well for him. But uh, he could get it across the plate. But as he started playing, there was some interesting developments that you begin to see. You watch that little t-ball league, you know, you watch those kids and, man, they don't even, they don't even, they don't care about hitting the ball. They just want to run around. They just want to go hit something or do something or you whatever. They don't, not too concerned about it. But as they grow, things begin to change. And I think it was about maybe six, seven, eight years old, somewhere around in there, they start, the kids start actually pitching. Instead of it being coach pitch, it's kid pitch. Maybe they'd let the kids pitch one inning, or uh, then later as they got 9, 10, 11 years old, that type of thing, the kids pitched the whole games. Things began to change when the kids started pitching and when kids started training and learning. Most of the time, all you ever saw was a straight ball, if you know what I mean, typically a fastball. It just came straight across the plate. Now, it may have been a little loopy because the kids couldn't hardly get it there, and so they had to put a little air under it. But usually it was a normal pitch. I remember Alden when he first started getting into the all-star teams and different things like that, and we went off to tournaments. 
And all of a sudden, we saw kids who were throwing curveballs. It's something we had never seen before. These kids had never seen before. They're standing at the plate waiting for a, for a fastball right down the middle, right? Like they all were supposed to be. Just get it across the plate, Johnny. It's okay. Just get it across the plate. And all of a sudden, this ball comes in. <laughs> what in the world was that? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Strike one. It was a curveball. And I'll tell you, it was funny. Those kids, literally kids, nine, ten years old, can crush a fastball. They could hit me. They could, and I could go up and I'd pitch those kids, and I could try to throw it as hard as I could, and they could still hit me. I don't know how fast I can throw. Maybe thirty, something like that. Forty. I probably not. It's probably about it, honestly. But they could hit my fastball. But as soon as somebody threw a curveball, what we started calling junk, kids were like, "We can't hit that." And that's what happens a lot of times in Christianity. Christians, things start happening to you and I, and we don't know how to react. Those kids would stand there in a box, and literally kids would take all three pitches because they didn't know how to even swing it at a curveball. And I think about that, and it reminds me of a few stories. I, I did a little research with the major leagues, and really in the past it was almost all fastballs, uh, change-ups, but pretty straight pitches years and years ago. And then the curveball starts coming. And literally, I mean, it, it was in the 70s, and 80% of pitches were straight pitches. Now, it's almost 50-50, whether it's going to be a curveball or a fastball. These guys that are in the major leagues, they can hit fastballs all day long. But some of them still struggle hitting curveballs. They still struggle hitting curveballs. You wonder why sometimes Christians struggle. I know we're not in a baseball game, and it's not a game, but the reality is we struggle sometimes because there's things that come our way that we have a hard time with. And David had some things come his way that he had a hard time with. In fact, it's such a, a real story that back in 1915, my son shared this story with me. Back in 1915, a hitter by the name of Ray Chapman. His name was Ray Chapman, if you've ever heard that name. Nobody probably, I don't know if anybody was here in 1915, but uh, <clears throat> Ray Chapman came to the plate and he had taken the first two pitches as strikes. And he began to walk back to the dugout after two strikes. The umpire, his name was Billy Evans, he looked over at Ray and he said, hey Ray, where are you going? You still got one strike left. And Ray looked at the umpire and he said, sir, you can keep them. Or you can keep it, it won't do me any good. He had already given up. Right. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians who have given up. When curveballs come, you've got to learn to adjust. And I'm, I'm not talking about changing your doctrine, talking cha about changing your beliefs. I'm talking about adjusting and rolling with the, the swing with, with, with the pitches and go with it and serve God and do what you can. So something happens. I mentioned this morning some of my health issues. And those things happen. But don't quit. Get back up to the plate. Some of those kids, they were, they were struck out before they ever went to the plate. I want you to see this, though. The first thing I want to encourage you to do this, this evening is to, number one, focus on the Lord. Focus on the Lord. When you're up to bat, you've got to figure out what's coming your way. As there's different pitches being pitched, you've got to figure out what's coming your way. Is this the devil? Is this the Lord? Is this just somebody that's trying to torment me? Obviously, using the devil using them to torment me. What is this? But you've got to focus. What is the number one thing that we tell kids when they're playing baseball? Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the ball. And listen, if you bail out, a lot of those kids would bail out because the ball's coming in as a curveball. It looks like it's coming right at them. And they would bail out. And they're like, no, you, we, coaches were saying, no, you've got to stay in the box. Stay in the batter's box. Let me encourage a Christian, stay in the batter's box. You're going to face some strange pitches. By the way, the last time I checked, very few, very few hitters today are anywhere close to 300, batting 300, if you know what I'm talking about. Very few. In fact, it's a pitcher's league right now in the majors instead of a hitter's league. Most of those batting averages, 270, 280, 290, those are really good bat batting averages today. By the, last, by, by the way, the last time I checked that, that's less than one out of three times you hit, go up to hit that they're actually hitting the ball. But they still go up to the plate. There are some guys that have horrible batting averages against certain pitchers. 
certain pitcher. They can't hit him. It's like, what in the world? I can't hit this guy. And I think part of it is mentally they go up and say, I can't. How many times have we said, I can't do this? There's no way. I can't do this. But the Bible says I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Also, last time I checked, the Bible says a just man falleth seven times and then riseth up again. You know what that means? That's failure. You know what Edison said about the light bulb? He, after the, the thousand, he, he actually just got the light bulb right at number 1,000. He tried 900. He said, they asked him, he said, well, what do you think about that? And he said, well, I, what I learned was I found 999 ways not to build a light bulb. But he didn't quit. That was a guy who never slept. Literally, he, honestly, he didn't sleep. If you ever study anything about Edison, he'd usually sleep in 20-minute spurts. And then he'd, he'd, he'd sleep in his lab, and he would sleep, he'd just fall asleep like this on the, on the bench, and he'd get back up and 20 minutes later and start working on his invention again. But he found 999 ways how to not succeed. But what's important is succeeding and keep persevering for Jesus. Focus on the Lord. I want you to notice, the psalmist says, hey, in chapter 13, he says, how long, Lord, are you going to forget about me? But what happens in verse 5, I love. I love what he says, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. You know what we have to do? The reality is, is there are days where we wake up and honestly, you may wake up tomorrow and not necessarily feel like you're saved. But you know what? You're not trusting. I'm not holding on to Jesus. He's holding on to me. Because the reality is, is it's not by my works of righteousness, but it's his work of righteousness on the cross of Calvary. I can't keep myself saved. He's the one who died on the cross for you and I. He's the one who died on the cross for me. And he's the one who saved me. And he is the one who can keep me. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not my works that keep me saved. So there's going to be days where you're going to wake up and you're just not going to feel like a Christian today. But what do we trust in? We focus on the Lord, right? We focus on the promise of God. What does the promises of God say? Do I have to feel like I'm saved to be saved? No. You trust in the promises, the precious promises of the Lord. And focus on the Lord. When you're in that batter's box for Jesus Christ tonight, let me encourage you. Focus on the Lord. Keep your eye on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Number two, I want you to know you're going to have to find out the truth. You're going to have to find out the truth. How many of you have ever had those little gloom, despair, and agony on me moments? <laughs> Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I might as well go eat worms. But you know what? That's not true. That's not true. Regardless of whether you feel like no one likes you, and the truth could be maybe there's no one in this church that likes you. I highly doubt that. But if that were even true, I promise you, you can't use that excuse. Because Jesus Christ cared enough about you. God the Father cared enough about you to send his son to die on an old rugged cross for you. What in the world? Those kids looking at those pitches coming in. Whoop, boom, where did that thing go? You ever heard about a knuckleball? Some of those old knuckleballers, I think Phil and Joe Necro were guys that pitched those knuckleballers years and years ago. And they, there's people that used to talk about those knuckleballs, those good knuckleballer pitchers, that they literally, when you're watching that ball coming in, it's dancing. Right. How in the world does a ball dance? I have no idea. And the, 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 the laces aren't moving. The thing's just going... Whoop, whoop, whoop. And it's literally probably coming in at 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. But you know what? If you don't learn to focus and find the truth of what's coming at you, you see, the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's trying to devour you. You better be aware of that. And listen, the Bible says we're to put on the shield of faith that we might quench the fiery darts of the wicked, folks. It's coming at us. You better be aware of what's going on, and you better learn to find the truth. Focus on the Lord. Number two, find the truth. Look at what he says in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Did the rest of you read? Did you, did you get the rest of that chapter? The beginning of that chapter, it sounds to me like David's boo-hoo-hoo-hoo. But at the end, he has to come to reality. Reality check. Hello, wake up. 
you know what? You're going to have to learn to focus on the Lord. And not only focus on the Lord, but find the truth. What is the truth in this situation? Does God really care about me? Of course he does. I already mentioned that this morning. Does Jesus care? Of course he cares. Yes, he cares. David says in verse 6, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Well, listen, God's been good. You just look out in the parking lot, and I know that's not the most important thing, but many of you are driving nice cars out there. Praise God! He's given you vehicles to get around, and even if it's not a nice car, it's more than what a lot of people have. And God's blessed you and provided for you. Listen, we live in a day and age where kids today, it just seems like, well, I should have a brand new car as soon as I get 16. I know that's the way it works. It's not the way it works. You're going to have to work for those things. But listen, God will bless and God is a bountiful God. Focus on the Lord and find the truth. Which pitch is it? Which pitch is it? What pitch is coming at you? What's coming at you? What's going on? And listen, that's where we need to run to the Lord and cling to the Lord when we're in a situation where we're not sure what's going on. Lord, is this me? Is this you speaking to me? Is this the devil just trying to get at me? What is this, Lord? Help me. Help me to find the truth. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And if there is, then lead me in the way everlasting. Not only when we're in a situation and life seems to be throwing us some different situations or some difficult situations. Focus on the Lord. Find the truth. And number three, fight the fight. I want to encourage you to fight the fight. I, sh I shared that example quickly about... Ray Chapman, who just said, you know what, I'm going back after two strikes because I can't hit this guy. There are far too many Christians who say, I cannot do this. Right. You know what, I think the truth about this, I heard a message, several messages about this many uh, over the years, but we may have to say something like this, I can't, but God can. I can't, but God can. And every one of us have been in that place where, Lord, I can't do this. I can't go to this funeral. Lord, I can't handle the loss of this situation, or I can't, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with the loss of my job. But God, you're going to have to intervene. You're going to have to intervene. And you know what we have to do is we just have to step up and fight the good fight of faith. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll see those verses. These are all verses you're going to know. These last couple verses we'll look at. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want you to notice verse 12. When you get there, tell me what it says. Fight the good fight of faith. You know what? You're in a noble fight, folks. There is a fight between the spirit and the flesh each and every day. There is a fight between good and evil every day. There is a, fi a fight between the prince of the power of the air and God himself each and every day. You and I know that that fight is real. And that fight for the Christian today to live for Jesus is real. I talked to a friend of mine not too long ago, and, and I, he was discouraged. I, I, said, I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I just was out with one of my good friends. And you can just see their teenagers, how worldly they've become. This thing can be a curse, folks, a big curse. A big curse. You better be careful, teenagers. I know we pick on teens with these things, but what about adults? Right. The garbage you can get at your fingertips, you're going to have to fight it because your flesh will look for the wrong things. Your flesh. I listen, I, years ago, my, well, my wife and I, we, we, we fought it for a long time. We fought the whole Facebook thing. Anybody else like me fought the whole Facebook thing for years? I fought the whole Facebook for thing for years. I said, I am not doing this. I do not want to get on Facebook. I, this thing has to be from the devil. I, you know, whatever. And you, you, however you feel about that, that's fine. I'm not preaching against Facebook. But I, I said, all right, let's go ahead and get Facebook. You know, pastor of church, we got new ministries, different things like that going. Maybe we should get on Facebook. We got on Facebook, and Brother Maple, about the first two weeks I was on Facebook, I'm looking at everything. Man, there's friends I haven't heard from you in years. I haven't seen this person in years. This is cool, man. There's people on there, all kinds of stuff. I thought, man, maybe Facebook isn't so bad. Lo and behold, it didn't happen very, it wasn't very long. And I saw the garbage that Christians were putting on Facebook. I'm not talking about lost people. I expect that. 
I expect those lost friends and those lost family members and those people that we know don't know Jesus Christ, I expect them to put a picture of them holding a beer on Facebook. I expect that. But I don't expect it from God's people. Amen. I don't expect it from a child of God. I don't expect it from people who attend my church. Amen. And the reality is, as you'll find out the truth, a lot of those people have given up the fight. They're not fighting for what's right. They're just going with the flow. Just go with the flow. Hey, listen, that's not the biblical way to do it. Fight the good fight of faith. And let me encourage you to step up to the plate. We had those kids a lot of times in the Little League where they, they'd step up to the plate, you know, right before the pitcher got ready to pitch it. And as soon as he pitched it and they found out he was throwing it faster than they wanted to hit it, and then they stepped back. How are you going to hit it when it's clear out here? These little kids with these little short bats are like, yeah, you're not going to get that bat over the plate. You've got to step up to the plate. You know what? You might get hit once in a while. But get back up. And fight the good fight of faith. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. I hope you've laid hold on eternal life. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior today. You've nailed it down. You're 100% sure. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You all know these verses too. We're going to have to not only focus on the Lord and find the truth, but we're going to have to fight the fight. And then number four, point number four, I want you to notice this. We're going to have to follow through. We're going to have to follow through. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. These last two points really go together, but I think they'll be a help to you. Uh, I want you to know that we're going to have to follow through. Far too many Christians are falling away. Right. Don't be one of those. Hey, listen, I've seen people, and, and I was just talking to, uh, to Brother Maple this afternoon, his, his dear wife. I was, man, I, you know, and I mentioned this morning about our anniversary 20 years and how many families are divorced and just, and, and listen, if you're divorced, God loves you, folks. Right. He still loves you and he, he forgives, but I'm telling you, that's not necessarily God's plan. It isn't God's plan. God wants you, one, one, one man and one woman for life. In fact, it was awesome coming down the road. We saw down the highway, we saw a sign that says, marriage is between one man and one woman. And I said, I look at my wife, I said, how do they get away with that? We get, we get lynched in Pennsylvania if we try to put that up there. She said, well, this is, some of the kids said, Dad, this is still Ohio. And I'm like, yeah, well, have you been to Columbus lately? Have you been to Cincinnati lately? <laughs> have you been to Cleveland lately? <laughs> Listen. I'm glad that God has made it one man and one woman. And I'm glad that we are able to stay together and fight that good fight of faith together. Finish the course. How sad it is people have been married 50 years divorcing. What sense does that make? You've been through so much. Keep your eyes on Jesus and just keep on going. You've pastored a church for 50 years. Why quit now? I'm not saying that you can't maybe help, have somebody come and help you or uh, be the uh, pastor emeritus or whatever that means. I don't even know what that stuff means, you know. But anyways, it's, it's okay. But just keep on plugging away. Amen. Keep on fighting the fight. Praise the Lord for Christians who will keep on. And step up to the plate and they will swing through it. I, I wanted to share this example real quickly. My son, when, when he first started hitting, he's a decent hitter, better pitcher, but decent hitter. Um, but he struggled with hitting because when he would try to hit, all he was concerned about was contact. That was it. He just wanted to make contact with the ball. All right. He didn't want to strike out, sw sw you know, sw you know, swing away, miss it, miss the ball. He wanted to make contact. So in trying to make contact, when he would swing, he would do this kind of thing. And if, if essentially what would happen, and he didn't understand this until he understands it now, but essentially what would happen a lot of times was he was bunting the ball all the time and didn't even know he was bunting. That wasn't the plan. The plan was to swing away. I love it when, the, when, when somebody, you know, you're watching a, a batter or watching a, a coach, and he's like, swing away. A 3-0 count, you're going to let him swing away. He's probably a pretty good hitter. You're going to let him swing away. And those guys sometimes will hit it out of the park on a 3-0 count. It's your fault for throwing it right down the middle of the plate. Right. You know what those guys do, how it gets out of the park? You follow through. And what Christians need to do is follow through 
with the guidelines that are in this book, and what you and I need to do, what this pastor needs to do, what this preacher today, and what this singer needs to do, and what this pastor needs to do, and every one of you that are called to serve God, and you're a child of God, we just need to follow through. Swing through it. I promise you you'll hit the ball a whole lot farther. I know there's guys that get in slumps. If you ever watch baseball, those guys get in slumps. They're all, oh, man, they're in a slump. Man, this guy's in an, uh, he's in an 0 for 30 slump. He's not doing good. And all of a sudden, he gets up there to hit. And all of a sudden, he sends a hard line drive to center field. And the announcers go, hmm, maybe that's the start of something good. He was out, but he at least made good contact and he hit it hard. You hit the ball hard, good things can happen. Listen, let me encourage you as a child of God, hit the ball for Jesus. Get out there, get busy, follow through with that swing. Don't choke up. We're not looking for bunts today. <laughs> I may be a place and there may be a time for that. You may be able to put a point in there that says, hey, we need to bunt it once in a while. I don't know. But listen, I want to encourage you to follow through. Swing all the way through that ball. And then number five, I want to encourage you to finish the course. Finish the course. It's a very similar point, very same, same thought, essentially. The Bible says, I have fought a good fight. Fight a good fight, folks. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Can I tell you today that when you do that, there is a reward for you. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. What's the Bible say? A crown of righteousness. You want to throw some crowns at the feet of Jesus? Of course. But you're not going to be able to do it unless you follow through. Follow through with it. Finish the course. Hey, don't be one of those that, that, hey, they were in church for 30 or 40 years and now you haven't seen them in two or three years. Don't be one of those. Amen. Follow through. Follow the course. God will bless you for it. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. In closing, let me encourage you, Christian. Do all you can for Jesus. Do all to the glory of God. Let me encourage you to hit it out of the park. I don't know what life's going to throw at you. This could be one of those weeks that may be great for you, but it also might be one of those weeks, kind of like yesterday for us, when my head was spinning. And I'll be honest with you, last night in the trailer, I had to pray. I said, Lord, I don't know if I can preach and sing tomorrow. You're going to have to do it, Lord, because I can't. I can't, but God can. Let me encourage you to hit it out of the park for Jesus, folks. Get up there swinging. Do something for Jesus. So you made a mistake. You saw how many mistakes I made. Brother, you saw how many chord changes I miss. I mean, I'm like, whoa, where am I? Okay, all right. I'm playing a song right now. I'm in Bible Baptist in Lancaster. Okay, that's where I'm at. But you know what? That doesn't make us quit. We just get right back up and do it again. You know what? There's far too many Christians that are falling off the course. And now all they want to do is sit on the bench. They just want to sit on the bench, but I tell you, there's no action on the bench. There's no action on the bench for Jesus. You know what? I think about that song. Preachers are weary and singers are tired. But it's still, there's still a fight that we have as Christians over just one more soul. God cares about that one soul. He cares about that one person. He cares about you tonight. Listen, young man, young woman, adult, do you know Jesus? Don't go away without him. I hope you enjoyed the singing. I hope you enjoyed the message. But and more importantly, I hope you know Jesus. And if you don't, don't go away without him. Listen, trust him tonight. Open your heart's door to Jesus. He wants to come in. Listen, he wants to save your soul. Child of God, listen, teenagers, I've seen it too often. I'm not an old man. I understand that. But I'm old enough to see and to know we've lost a lot of teenagers to this world. We've lost a lot of them. As soon as they're old enough to get out of church, they're gone. Young people, you will regret every minute of it. Stay in the fight for Jesus. Stay in the house of God. Keep on keeping on. And God bless you as you do it. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for these folks. I thank you for their patience with me and for with us tonight. I thank you for though we go and we hit, we, we see curveballs in life and we're not real sure sometimes what to do with them. The Lord, just help us to swing through the pitch. And just keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to focus where we need to and to fight that good fight of faith. Lord, I don't know what folks is 
uh, things that they're dealing with today, what they might need, but I just pray you bless each and every one during this invitation. Do what only you can. And Lord, our prayers, if there be one soul here that knows, doesn't know you, that they would come and receive you tonight. And if there's a child of God who's maybe, maybe riding the bench, maybe a child of God who's straddling the fence, Lord, we can't serve two masters, for either you will love the one and hold to the other, or you will hate the one and cling to the other. Lord, help us to cling to you and keep on that, keep keeping on that fight of faith. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor. Lord, Lord, Lord.